Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Slary, and I wanted to welcome you all today. I'm here joined with my colleague, Andrea. Um, and so let's get started. Our presentation today is participate in our democracy and become a U.S. citizen. So first of all, um, today with you is Alliance San Diego, and we are a community organization whose mission is to build a collective power so we can create an inclusive democracy. And what that means for all of you here today is that we want to work with you and we want to work with our community so that we all can engage effectively in our in the civic process so that we can make systemic change and shape the future that belongs to all of us. And that we know together we create a more inclusive democracy where all people can achieve their full potential in an environment of harmony, justice, safety, and equality. So we would love it if you join Alliance San Diego and work with us in any capacity that you can. So today um, you're met with the Human Rights Department and this department consists of three people as of right now, myself being the immigration attorney, Michelle Soleri. We have Hector Oviedo, who is our DOJ fully accredited representative and Andrea Tapali who is our upcoming DOJ accredited representative. Um, and we provide a lot of different types of legal services in-house. We provide consultations, help with naturalization, DACA, green card renewals, TPS. Um, but beyond providing legal services, we also refer out to other organizations or uh, private practice attorneys that are known, trusted, and respected in the community uh, to provide any services that we're unable to provide. And on top of our legal services, we do education outreach like the one tonight where we go over citizenship, know your rights presentation, public charge. And really, if there is any topic that is about immigration that you would want us to come talk to you or your organization about, we would be happy to do that as well. So um, let's get started. So today we are gonna talk about a couple of different things. One being naturalization eligibility, um, who can apply to be an, a citizen? When can they apply? And um, are there any exceptions to the rules that are there? Um, are there any waivers? And we'll go through some of the benefits of becoming a citizen and ways to avoid fraud and then go over some questions and answers that some of you may have. So let's get started. All right, do you qualify for citizenship? So these are the basic requirements for naturalization, and we will go ahead and go through each of these different requirements in more depth, but here's an overview to get started. So first, you have to be at least 18 years of age, and you have to be a lawful permanent resident for at least five years or three years if you got it, your lawful permanent residency status through marriage. You have to live in the jurisdiction for three months, so you have to live in a place where you're going to apply for three months. And you must have continuous residence and physical presence um, for five years. But that is different, once again, if you got your green card through marriage, it, then it's reduced to only three years. Um, and on top of those requirements, you also have to be somebody of good moral character. And that's kind of a term of art that can mean a whole lot of things. And we'll go over what that what that really means in some more detail. And as all of you know, there is an exam that's part of this and there's that where you have to show that you um, speak proficient English, you can read and write in English, and there's a civics exam. And then lastly, there is an oath for you where you swear under penalty of perjury that you will be loyal to the US Constitution and the US. Um, so as for being a lawful permanent resident, um, remember how I said you had to be a lawful permanent resident for five years? So the exception to that is for marriage. So if you got your green card through your U.S. citizen spouse, you have to show that you lived together for the full three years and the spouse was a citizen during these three years. So what that means is that say you became a lawful, lawful permanent resident through your spouse, but your spouse was actually a green card holder. Um, you would have to wait until they became a citizen, then wait out those three years. So say six months after you got your green card, your spouse became a citizen, then you would technically have to wait three and a half years in order to become um, a citizen through marriage. But uh, also, 
you know, sometimes people split up, there's a divorce, say you got your green card through marriage, and now you are separated and got a divorce, you can then wait out the full five years and apply for your lawful permanent residency that way. There are a couple of very, very specific exceptions to the three, five year rules. Uh, one is if you are a member of the U.S. Armed Forces, the military does have the ability to do rapid naturalization for for those that are enrolled in the military. Um, and but even for that, your green card must be. Uh, and when you apply, your green card needs to be valid for the next six months before applying for naturalization. Um, and I and I say that as a as a best practice, right? So the reason why your green card needs to be valid for six months before applying for naturalization is that your um because technically that's how long it's supposed to be for them to pat um to process a green card renewal, right? So your green card proves that you are a lawful permanent resident and you need that proof in order to leave the United States and come back in, but you also need that if you are going to be applying for a job. And so uh, the best practice or the best way to do it is to have your green card be valid for six months when you apply for naturalization. That way, if your green card expires in the, while you're waiting for your citizenship, you can go ahead and ask for there to be an extension to your green card without having to pay that additional fee. So you really wanna think about the timing on when you're applying for naturalization. Um, but just because your green card expires does not mean that you are not a lawful permanent resident. And that's something that gets uh, con confusing sometimes, but it's always in best practice to have a valid green card. But even if you had an expired green card, um, you wouldn't be denied citizenship for not having a valid green card at the time or an unexpired green card at the time of your interview. So where can you apply? So you have to live in that area for three months in the district or state in which you're applying for naturalization. So a student who's over 18 can apply under the jurisdiction of their school as well. So students have a kind of a special situation, you know, they use their parents' address, they move away to college, um, and so they kind of have a home place there and they have a home place with their parents. So they allow them to have jurisdiction or they have the ability to apply for naturalization in either of those two locations. Um, but they still have to, um, but everybody has to be in a place for three months to qualify to do it in that location. And the reason is it, the government doesn't want people moving to a place because they feel that a particular office is better at processing applications. Because if they allow people to do that, there might be issues with the flow of applications getting through an office. So you also have to prove that you have had continuous residence and physical presence. But they sound the same, but they're slightly different. So um, continuous residence means that you have maintained a general residence within the United States for five years. So you have a house, you have rent, you, um, you say that the United States is your home, you pay taxes, you're enrolled in school, you have a job, all those things show continuous residence. So you have continuous residence, even if you go on a trip, out of the country for three months, you still have continuous residence. You didn't change your place of living. You just happen to go out of the country for a certain period of time. And then physical presence is the current time that the applicant has been in the United States before submitting the application. So you have to prove that you have been physically in the, in the United States, physically present for more than uh, two and a half years of the five years prior to uh, you applying. So essentially you've been in the U.S. more than you've been abroad. And so that that's one of the things that they'll look at. But we're going to go ahead and go through an example. So we have Luis here. And Luis has been a lawful permanent resident for five years. And three years ago, he went to visit his family in Salvador for three months. And then his father died. And he went to El Salvador to help his mother readjust to his life, her life without her husband. And he returned back in July 13th, 2021. So 
we got to think about his his time abroad. So he was gone for three months and he left for a year and a year and two months. Um, what do you think? Do you think Luis abandoned his residence by going abroad for two months? Um, go ahead and fill in the poll and let us know. All right. So we had a couple of answers come through. We're getting some more. Um, okay, so we are seeing uh, in poll. So, okay, so we have 88% says no and 13% says it depends. So, um, so, that is a really good point. So there's, it's a little bit tricky here because there's a little thing that I didn't tell you about uh, and might change your answer if I had. Um, so he didn't intend to leave the United States, but he wasn't living here, right, uh, for over a year. And it's presumed that you abandon your residence in the United States if you go abroad for more than six months. There are exceptions and you can say, you can talk about all the circumstances and say how they didn't abandon their residency because they were planning on helping mom readjust after the fact. They had no intentions of continuing to live in El Salvador, but it's the burden is going to be on Luis to prove that. And so things that he could do to show that he really continued his residence here is that he had a house or he was paying rent here in the U.S. He continued to pay taxes. He, he maybe had a wife that he left behind in the United States. And we knew that he was going to come back to be with his wife. But if you know that you are going to be traveling abroad for an extended period of time, you can always apply for a re-entry permit so that um, you're letting the government know that you will be traveling and that you will be gone beyond the six months, but the government knows that you're not abandoning your status. And this is something that you can apply for before leaving the United States. And so really the onerous is gonna be on the weeds to prove that he did not abandon his residence, but um, all, some of these factors may push in favor of saying that he abandoned. So good moral character. So. The office looks at a couple of different things to determine whether you have good moral character. And here are some examples of somebody that may lack good moral character in the eyes of immigration. So uh, violating the law on controlled substances anywhere. Um, this can be an issue particularly in, um, in California when it comes to marijuana, it is legal. Uh, in the state of California, but not nationally. And there's been, there's some movement on that right now, but as of right now, it is still considered a controlled substance. Um, fail, uh, uh, false testimony, testimony to obtain immigration benefits. So that could be lying on an application to become a permanent resident. So I've seen all sorts of things in this area, like say you uh, put on your application that you had never been in the United States, but it turns out you lived here for two years, went abroad, and then your spouse petitioned for you to come into the United States. Or, um, you were applying for national uh, for lawful permanent residency status as an agricultural worker, but you didn't work in agriculture and somebody wrote you a letter that was actually a false document. And so those are things that can prevent you from becoming a U.S. citizen um, and show that you don't have good moral character, or at least in the eyes of immigration. Um, if you've been convicted of a crime, being incarcerated for over 180 days, um, after a conviction is a sign of not having good moral character, failure to pay child support or alimony, and then not having registered with the U.S. Selective Service. So 
um, men who are in at the age where they could serve in the military, so ages 18 to 26, have to register themselves with something called U.S. Selective Service. And that is regardless of your uh, whether or not you have immigration status at the time. So we have people all the time that um, didn't apply for selective service and um and then they were undocumented at the time. And then at some point they were able to get their green card or their lawful permanent residency status. And it became an issue at that point. Um, and then failure to pay taxes, that is also something does, that does not reflect well on good moral character. And then conviction for welfare fraud. So um, stating that you don't have income when you do in order to qualify for benefits that you didn't necessarily qualify for. Um, and a little bit, well, I guess before I go a little into criminal record, the last thing I want to say about good moral character is, yes, these are factors that implicate good moral character. It, it, these are factors that immigration considers, but it doesn't mean that you can't become a citizen because you had an issue with one of these things. Um, you know, for the most part, good moral character, they're looking at it for the last five years. Um, so you have to prove good moral character for five years, and then more questionable things in the past could have happened. <laughs> um, but the last five years, you really want to be able to show that you've, you've demonstrated good moral character and you haven't had any of these issues. Um, and, you know, something like failure to pay taxes. Uh, if you fail to pay your taxes and you are currently on a tax payment plan, um, that they won't even consider that to be an issue. And then not having selected service, if you apply for a citizenship when you are 31, they don't even care about your selective service anymore. Uh, criminal record. So you have to disclose everything on your application with your criminal record, whether you say it or not immigration already has this information on you. So uh, you have to say if you've ever been arrested, fined, detained, and you have to bring documentation with you um, to your naturalization interview. And they want certified copies of things. Um, and if you or your family members have any pending arrest or warrant or deportation order, you definitely want to tell your attorney or your accredited representative because you know, your representative is there to help you and to guide you through this process. So if there is something that could prevent you from getting a benefit or prevent you from getting what you need, then it's so important that you share it with the attorney because it might be one of those things that I mentioned that you can cure in the process and there's not, and it's not going to prevent you from getting it, but it does need to be addressed at your interview or when you file your documents. So for the criminal record, um, they ask, you know, they ask for all sorts of things, right? So uh, for, you want a certified copy of any court decision, but I will tell you, um, they do ask for copies of arrest report and sentencing records and documentation of the, of the result of any traffic incident. Um, but they're not necessary, you know, and this is what what tends to happen when you go unrepresented. They will ask you for your uh, arrest report, your sentencing records. Uh, they'll push you to get tickets that haven't been, um, they'll push you to get all sorts of documents, but tr really and truly, they only are, you are only required to provide a certified copy of any court decision. So uh, that's one of the benefits of having somebody there to advocate for you because they frequently ask you to bring more documents than you are legally required to provide to them. So, you know, there are a lot of different things that you have to prove when going for citizenship. Um, and so I wanna talk about some of the exceptions, some of the rules um, so that we can get everybody to become a citizen that qualifies. So let's talk about the English portion. Um, you know, lots of times people are really nervous about taking the exam in English. And so there is the ability to take the exam in your native language. So if you're 50 years old and you've been a lawful permanent resident for 20 years, you can have your interview in your native language 
and the exam in your native language. And so that's a huge, that's a huge benefit for, for somebody that um, hasn't, hasn't learned English or feels uncomfortable in English. But in order to qualify for this exception uh, or exemption, uh, USCIS has been requiring uh, individuals to prove that they have been a resident for 20 years and have been physically in the United States for 20 years. So it it may be document intensive for you to, to prove that. The other um, individuals are 55 year olds who've been a lawful permanent resident for 15 years. They can also get it in their native language. But if you're 65 years old, and you have been a resident for 20 years, you even get a shortened exam. So not only do you get it in your native language, instead of the exam being 100 questions, uh, possibility of 100 questions being asked of you, the list of potential questions is down to 20. Um, and so that's a huge benefit. And so I guess, um, and then just a little bit about the exam. Um, you know, you have to get 60% on your exam. So if they will ask you 10 questions and you have to get six of the 10 questions, right? If you get the first six right, they won't even ask you anymore. And as far as the English portion, they will have a screen that has a sentence written on the screen and you have to read it out loud. And then the officer will read you a sentence and you have to write it on the tablet. Um, the beauty is that the words that they can use in the exam are limited to a hundred words that they tell you ahead of time what they're going to be. So uh, some people are are unable to take the exam for medical reasons, and so some people can qualify for a disability waiver. And so what what the disability waiver will do is it will allow you to not have to take the English exam or the civics exam, but you have the burden of proof as the applicant and literacy alone is not a valid reason not to, or a reason to get an N64, N648, which is the disability waiver. Um, the, you have to show that the impairment is permanent. Uh, it's so severe, the applicant is unable to learn English, history, or civics, and it can't be a result of illegal drug use. So just to kind of give you an example of some of the things that that we've seen, um, we've seen individuals with Alzheimer's get this approved because they have the, they're unable to remember information or retain information. Um, we've seen individuals with certain developmental dis uh, delays or individuals that have been in accidents that um, have prevented them from remembering things. And, and so there's been a couple of different things that we've seen improve, but they're not, they're not as easy and readily available as one might hope. Um, but for those medical right, uh, waivers, there are a couple things you need. You need first the N648 application completed and signed by a licensed doctor or clinical psychologist or a doctor of osteopath. So um, it has to be signed by the doctor, it has to be filled out by the doctor, um, and it has to be submitted within six months of the doctor's signature. So uh, depending on where you're getting your services or um, if you're applying for citizenship on your own, you want to make sure that you are going to your doctor for this N-648 within a, a certain period of time of you being able to actually submit your application because you don't want to have it and then have it expire before uh, before you're able to submit it. And the doctor must clearly describe how your disability or impairment affects your ability to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of English and or civics. Um, so the other thing that I, I've seen a lot is people don't become citizens because of the filing fees. And so I wanted to go over a couple of different ways that people can move forward with their application. So one, they can pay the filing fee. Uh, two, they can ask for a fee waiver. Uh, three, they could uh, apply for it with their credit card. Or four, there's these zero interest immigration loans that are put forth through the Mission Asset Fund. And the Mission Asset Fund essentially pays the 
the loan or pays the filing fee for you, and then you pay them back in uh, monthly payments of seventy two fifty uh, for the next ten months. And so that that's a way to make it more affordable for you if you don't qualify for a fee waiver and you don't uh, have the funds to pay for the actual application. So um, if you wanted to qualify for a feed waiver, you, there's three different ways that you can do it. And I'm putting them in the ways of the easiest to prove to the hardest to prove. So the first one is, do you receive a means, uh, a means tested government benefit? That could be food stamps, social security, um, Medi-Cal is another one. If you have a verification, a benefit verification letter stamped, um, you're golden. There you get you'll get your fee waiver without any issues. The second one is that if your household income is below 150% of the federal poverty lines, then you could also qualify for for a fee waiver. And to qualify, you'd have to um, you'd have to submit your previous year's tax transcripts. Um, and you can get those online or by mail. And then lastly is extraordinary economic circumstances. So say you have a huge astronomical medical bill or you file for bankruptcy or something big has happened, then you can ask the government to forget, to allow you to move forward with a fee waiver because of what just happened. Um, these reasons generally don't get approved. Um, so I always I always stick to reasons one or two. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into it. So this is what the verification of benefits le letter looks like. And so you'll see that they have CalWORKs, food stamps, other, uh, and then they'll say how much you're given per month. They'll have your name, your case number, date, and then they'll have a stamp on the bottom. Um, and you can you can get it that way as well. And then for the partial fee waiver, if you say you make above 150% of the poverty line, but less than 200% of the poverty line, you can get a partial fee waiver, which would also, um, which is about half the price. So you can get half off and then you can combine that with a credit card or combine that with a check or whatever works best for you. And then I know I'm talking about poverty lines and all of that. So this is what this looks like in practical terms. So if you're applying for yourself, you qualify for a fee waiver if your in income is under 20385 And this is your household size, right? So if you claim on somebody on your taxes, they're part of your household or somebody claims you, you're part of their household. So if you are a single person um, you and you don't have a spouse or children and your parents don't claim you um, and you make $20,385 or less, then you get a full fee waiver. But if you make between twenty and 27000 then you would get a partial fee waiver. And then as your household size grows, the income grows as well. So say I make $10,000 and my spouse makes $11,000. Well, then our household income is only $22,000 and I, we would fall, fall in this category, the $27,465 category, and we would qualify for a full fee waiver. Okay. So what are the steps that you need to do in order to apply for your uh, for naturalization? So first you gotta fill out the form and, and you need to submit your N-400 with your pictures and payment and evidence. Um, evidence isn't anything crazy. It's just, um, if you would do the fee waiver, it's the proof, um, your verification of benefits or your tax transcripts, but also a copy of your green card um, so that they can verify that it is actually you Get applying for uh, citizenship. After that, you'll receive a receipt from USCIS about two to three weeks later, usually. Um, and then shortly after that, you'll get a biometrics notice. And since COVID started, what we've started to see is that you'll get a biometrics notice, but it'll generally say that your biometrics appointment has been waived and you don't actually have to attend the biometrics appointment. 
uh, and then you won't hear anything for months. <laughs> so it feels like immigration may have forgotten your case, but they didn't. Um, so you will get a notice for interview, and that's usually about three to four weeks before your actual interview, you'll get the notice. And at the interview, the, the officer is going to sit you down. They're going to review your whole application with you. Generally, they do the exam portion at the beginning part of the application. So um, on the civics portion, you have they'll ask you 10 out of the 100 possible questions they could ask you. And you need to get six out of the 10 correct. And say you fail your exam for whatever reason or you don't pass it that day, they will give you another appointment to try and take the exam again. And as I explained before, for the English portion, they read a sentence uh, to you in English and you write it down. Um, and then they have a sentence put on the tablet for you and you read it out loud in English. But the whole vocabulary is limited to 100 words and those words are provided for you on the USCIS website. Uh, and so this whole second page is a little bit different uh, now and it can so it, since COVID. So you will get a written notice of outcome by your immigration officer, but now it happens that same day. Um, and then you would use, you used to get an oath ceremony or a certain uh, notice for your oath ceremony, but if you have your interview early enough in the day and you're not changing your name, you will be sworn in as a citizen that same day um, and then and receive your certificate of naturalization right then and there. Um, not during your interview, they will they will call you up to the fifth floor where they will have the oath ceremony for you. Um, and this is always a reminder that you're not a citizen until you have that natural naturalization certificate in hand. Um, that's important because, um, you know, if say you apply for naturalization, everything goes well at your interview, but then for whatever reason, you don't become a citizen that day. Maybe it's um, you needed to send them proof of taxes or, you are going to legally change your name and you have to go through an oath ceremony before a judge um, and you can't become a citizen that day for that reason and in the interim you get arrested or you get a DUI or if something happens that can still affect your ability to become a citizen so it's really important that um, by, by all the rules, all the laws, and everything in between until you have that certificate in hand. Um, not that I'm advocating not to all the laws that really become a citizen, but um, it's especially important. And so this is just kind of like a quick little overview. You file your application, you re USCS receives everything, uh, you attend your biometrics appointment if you're given one, you attend your naturalization interview, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully that oath ceremony is the same day, but if not, you'll get an oath ceremony about a month later. So now you're a citizen. Um, what what comes with being a citizen? Why why even go through this process? It's like a lot of forms and an interview. It's kind of, it's, it's a process. So there are some really big benefits to becoming a citizen. First, uh, you get to vote. You get to decide what happens, um, not only on the federal level, but right here in our neighborhoods. You get to vote for things like uh, who's going to sit on our school boards, who's going to be members of city council. And in making those decisions, you're looking at who's going to make sure that you have everything that you need in your community. And so it's really important that when you become a citizen, you, you do vote so that you have a say as to what happens in your community. It's also protection from deportation. Once you're a citizen, you cannot be deported unless you committed fraud in your application process and they discovered that you, you were untruthful, but um, that I've never seen it actually happen. <laughs> so you won't, you won't be deported from the United States. Freedom to travel. I mean, you saw our friend uh, Jaime in the example below before that his his father passed away and he wanted to be in El Salvador with his mom for over a year and then he had to worry about losing his green card. I mean, if something like that happened and you're a U.S. citizen, you can travel. You can stay there for as long as you want or need. 
uh, you also get a U.S. passport, and that can be a huge benefit, uh, depending on where you want to travel. That might mean that you don't have to pay for certain visas. You might have the ability to travel to different places that you never thought of before. Um, to hold public office, if you wanted to be an elected official, you have to be a citizen. Um, and so that's another possibility for you. Government employment opportunities. Uh, lots of government jobs, have, you have to be a U.S. citizen for it. And not just the jobs, but even if you're going to um, provide services for or contract business to the government, sometimes they even require employment, uh, you be a U.S. citizen for those reasons. Public benefits. So um, there's a couple public benefits that you qualify for in addition to the ones that you qualify for now. So those would be your Social Security Disability Insurance. You now qualify for that under um, as a citizen. You qualify for the Social Security period. Not that you don't as a lawful permanent resident, but there are some restrictions with your Social Security if you travel abroad for a certain period of time. Um, but those all go away once you become a U.S. citizen. Uh, you no longer have to deal with USCIS. You don't have to report when you move. You don't have to tell them anything about yourself. You could be done. <laughs> um, and then ability to petition for certain family members. So, you know, if you are a U.S. citizen, uh, you you can now apply for your your brothers and sisters to become U.S. citizens. Say you have a spouse, um, uh, so that's the big one, or you have children that were married. If you were a lawful permanent resident, you couldn't petition for your married children. And so now you're a U.S. citizen, you could pe petition for your married children. Um, and so it opens some of those doors for you as well. Not to mention that uh, things are faster <laughs> when you're a U.S. citizen, generally speaking. And say you were applying for your spouse to become a lawful permanent resident, there's no wait list. They're no longer on the wait list if you're a permanent resident versus a lawful permanent resident. If you are a U.S. citizen versus a lawful permanent resident. Um, you know, all U.S. citizens and everybody, um, you have the right to express freedom of exp to express yourself, worship. Um, you have the right to prompt fair trial by jury. All these things are benefits that come here in the United States. You get to vote in elections for public officials. And the fair trial by jury, you get to be a juror for the very first time um, and experience what it's like to make decisions in cases. Um, and as I mentioned before, the federal benefits, running for elective office, um, but with all of those things comes with, uh, U.S. citizen responsibilities. And these are things that, um, that you will be agreeing to on when you take your oath. So, um, support and defend the Constitution, stay in, you know, you, it's your responsibility to stay informed on issues affecting your community, uh, participate in the democratic process, vote, <laughs> um, you have to obey federal, state, and local laws. Respect the rights, beliefs, and opinions of others. Participate in the local community. Uh, pay income and other taxes honestly on time. And serve on the jury and defend the country if the need should arise. And that's one that's um, definitely in your oath of allegiance at the time of your interview. And so I know that um, people are considering going out getting assistance for their uh, citizenship process, but it's really, really important that when you're doing that, you are also considering different ways to avoid fraud and making sure that you're not taking advantage of in the process. So first, um, get information about the person you're gonna work with before you, <laughs> before you start working with them. So the number one thing that people do, generally speaking, is get a recommendation from, from somebody that you know and trust. And while recommendations are great, I also recommend checking for credentials. You want to make sure that the person that is assisting you is somebody that is licensed to assist you. So this calbar.ca.gov, um, that will tell you if this attorney is licensed in the state of California. 
And then we also have justice.gov backslash EOIR. And so there are individuals like Hector on my team and soon to be Andrea on my team as well that are accredited by the Department of Justice to be able to help people in their immigration process even though they're not attorneys, they are accredited representatives. And so you can search for them or any other accredited representative at a nonprofit um, at this website. You wanna check for past disciplinary actions. You know, There's a lot of fraud that happens and you wanna make sure that, um, that you're going with somebody that's trusted and that responds to the community and if they, if they messed up in a case and, you know, you, you want to know those things and you can look that up at the CalBar website as well. Um, you also want to identify their areas of expertise. And the reason why that is so important is when you think about immigration, it is so complex. I can tell you that at least three rules of immigration change today <laughs> so that I can think of off the top of my head. And so you want somebody that is experienced and knowledgeable in immigration that can help you with anything that comes up in that area. If they are somebody that dedicates 20% of their time to immigration and 65% of their time to family law, you might start saying um, they might not be as knowledgeable as they need to be when helping you. And always, always, always get a written contract. That contract is your protection. Um, if something does go wrong in that contract, it, that it says what you can do in the event something goes awry. And you wanna keep copies of everything. You know, the, the written contract, the copies, that's what you would use to protect yourself if you're gonna um, file a complaint against the person that assisted you. So it's important to have all that information. So I really want to thank all of you for coming. I know that was a lot of information, so I'm here to answer any questions that any of you might have. Um, and right here, you have our phone number with our extension. You can always email us at immigration at alliancesd.org. Um, but we are happy to answer your questions now or in a private consultation with us. Um, as I mentioned, we do help people with their citizenship process. So I'll stay on the line to see if there's any questions.